I often get lit up in the comments sections of my videos when I review certain DACs for not trying them with upsampling because I know a lot of people find there's a huge benefit in upsampling through to various DACs, particularly those R2R DACs with NOS modes that are able to remove the filters from within the DAC by using NOS and therefore do the upsampling externally with software like HQ Player. And so rather than trying to include a review of upsampling in every single DAC that I ever come across, because realistically you can apply upsampling to any DAC you ever want to, rather than trying to do it in every single review, I thought it was time just to do a full review of HQ Player itself. Talk about what the benefits are, what the drawbacks are, whether I think it's a good option to use for you. And then of course, give you my opinions of whether or not I think it's something I'm going to be bringing into my future reviews, or whether I'm going to leave it as something off on the side. Now, apologies that my voice is so croaky today. I'm still getting over a cold. I'll do my best to keep this intelligible as I go through. And so now let's get started talking about HQ Player. For those not familiar, HQ Player is a piece of software that can sit out on its own as an actual player, as a media player that is. Or it can be used as an interface that you can send your music from a software like J River Media Center or Rune. You can send your media from those players via HQ Player and then out to your DAC of choice. And I say deck of choice, but that could also be a streamer of choice too. So HQ Player can send the music stream via things like USB connections, but also through network connections too. For those of you not familiar with the concept of upsampling, the idea of upsampling is not to find data that isn't already there. That's not actually possible. Those that talk about the fact that upsampling can't do anything because the data is limited to what was captured in the original sample... The second part of that statement is true. There is no extra data to be pulled out by doing upsampling. You're not adding in information that wasn't already there. What upsampling is doing is it's doing a higher quality job of reconstructing the waveform. And so essentially think about it as doing multiple extra analyses of the original samples to more perfectly and accurately reconnect all the dots in that sample and make sure that the end analog waveform is as close to the truth of the original as is possible. I'm not going to go further into it here. I know that some people don't believe in upsampling. That's fine. Others of you might not really understand upsampling. That's okay as well. You don't need to understand in depth here. But if you do want to understand it further, I did an interview series with Rob Watts from Cord Electronics ages back now on the channel. And he did a great job of explaining upsampling, what it's intended to do, what it's not intended to do, and kind of how it works. So I'll make sure to put a card here that you can click on so you can go through and watch that if you want to understand more about what upsampling is and isn't. But for now, I just want to focus on whether or not HQ Player is doing a good job of upsampling, not whether or not upsampling is good or bad. For the record, I think upsampling is great. I think it has significant improvements to bring if it's done well. So HQ Player, as I've already said, is software. It sits on your computer. It does the upsampling using your computer resources. So it can be a combination of your CPU and your GPU. It's going to do the upsampling there before sending the music out to your external processing device, be it a streamer or a DAC. You can download HQ Player for free and it will give you 30 minutes at a time to do evaluation, to play around with things. And then if you like it and you want it to work on a non-time limited basis, you can then buy it for around about $330 US dollars. Now I think based on what I'm seeing on their website, that might vary depending on where you are and what taxes get applied. But think about it as around about $300 to $330 US dollars for this software. If you compare that to buying a device like the M-Scaler from Cord, then it's a huge discount compared to the many thousands of US dollars you'd spend on an M-Scaler. That said, you also need to keep in mind that this is software, and that means it can sometimes be a little bit buggy, it can be a bit fiddly to set up sometimes, there are lots of different options which we'll talk about soon, and so it's not exactly a direct comparison in my opinion. I love the M-Scaler for the fact that you buy it, you plug it in, and it works. I don't like the fact that it's limited only really to cord devices if you want to get the most out of it, but I do love the fact that I can use it with a CD transport, I could use it with my television, I can obviously use it with my computer, I can use it with a streamer where the streamer serves the music into the M-Scaler, the M-Scaler does the upsampling and then passes it onto the DAC. There are so many different ways you can use it, and that's a bit different with HQ Player. With HQ Player, you have to have some sort of computer device, whether it's a Mac, a PC, or a Linux machine. There has to be a PC within your source chain. And that can make things a little bit difficult. It can also be hard to integrate it with things like video and media playback if you want to use upsampling for that. I'm not suggesting that you necessarily should, but my point is something like an M-Scaler can do that from any source. HQ Player really needs it coming from a computer source, such as Rune, JRiver, or the HQ Player 
actual player software itself. And so I don't say any of that to draw a conclusion that the M scatter is better or that HQ player is better. I don't mean to draw any conclusions that one or both are good, bad or indifferent. I'm just looking to separate them and explain when and why you might choose one over the other. Obviously price is a huge difference between them and that could be a big deciding factor for many as well. The other thing that I think is important to talk about here is the fact that there are just so many options when it comes to going through HQ Player that that's going to be very daunting for many. It was certainly a reason why it took me so long to getting around to do a full review because there's just so many variables to consider. For every single option that you might go and look at, there's then multiple choices, multiple possible variations for each option. And by the time you start combining all of those together, it can be really daunting and very much a barrier to entry. And with that in mind, I haven't tried in this review to cover off every single possible variation of combinations of settings you could use. What I've tried to do is go through the manual and really look for specific settings that I think might be interesting to test in terms of understanding what's the difference. Should you choose a longer or a shorter attenuation? Is it better to use linear or minimum phase filters? Do the dithering options actually make a difference or should you just stick with the default? And then of course, I wanted to round it all out by finding out, can you actually get an HQ player based setup to match what something like the M scale is doing? Because for some people you might say, I'm only ever gonna use PC audio. I want something that's gonna maximize my audio performance. I don't wanna spend money on something like the M scaler. So can I get the same level of performance, either identical or at least on the same tier, even if slightly different? Can I achieve that by only spending 300 odd US dollars on HQ player and then maximizing the settings? So that's all of what I've tried to aim to answer in this review. If you are looking for very specific breakdowns of what each individual filter, each individual dithering option or noise shaping option, what all of those do, then there's some great write-ups around the place. I found some good ones on HeadFi. There's also a brilliant one ages ago done by Audio Bacon. It's now with an outdated version of HQ Player, but I still think based on my findings here that everything he said over there is pretty much spot on. And he's also compared with the M Scaler. I've come to a slightly different opinion than what he said in his original one, but that could also be because I'm using a more recent version that might have some extra options. And so I know that's a lot of preamble, but I wanted to set expectations for what this is and isn't. And now let's dive into the actual content. For most of my testing, unless I tell you otherwise, I was using the Gustard R26 DAC. There was a couple of reasons for that. One of them is it's a fantastic DAC. The second one is it's got a true NOS mode. So you can switch off the filtering and have everything coming from the external directly processed with no internal filtering by the DAC. That's not entirely common across a lot of DACs. The only ones that I've really come across it with so far are some of the R2R DACs and the recently released and reviewed here on the channel, SMSL DO300. In the case of most chip-based DACs, so SMSL, Topping, all those brands that are using AKM or Sabre chips, in most cases, you don't have the ability to turn off the filtering in those DACs. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't use upsampling on them, but it's not always going to be as beneficial as with a DAC where you can completely switch off internal filtering. And that's often going to be called a non-oversampling mode, because oversampling inside a DAC is pretty much the same as upsampling outside a DAC. And so to kick things off here, my first test was to find out what's the actual difference between a short, medium, and long attenuation filter. To give you an idea of how this all gets set up, what I was able to do was I'd come into File and Settings within the HQ Player desktop software. And then the first thing I did was I'd set my output. Now I can't show you here because I don't currently have the Gustard connected up, but I'd set my output in here. I would choose what sort of output I was using, which in my case was via PCM initially. I did some DSD testing later on. And then from there, when I went over to the PCM settings, that's where I got to choose what my specific settings were going to be. And so for my initial tests, what I was looking to do was compare the sync short, the sync medium, and the sync long filters. Because each of those has a longer amount of attenuation, meaning it's going to cut off the noise or the high frequency sound sooner for short and later for long, and obviously medium being in the middle. And so my first test was to find out what's that going to do to the sound and therefore which one should you choose? If you have the choice within HQ player for short, medium or long attenuation, which one's going to be best for you? My first test was to get a bit of a baseline here. And so I started off with the Gustard receiving the signal with no upsampling at all. And then I switched on the sync short filter. What I found was that going from the non oversampled, non upsampled sound, what I was getting then when I went to the sync short filter was a slightly crisper sound with slightly better separation. 
I'd have to say that the difference wasn't massive, it wasn't a complete transformation, but the sink short filter was definitely a little bit cleaner, a little bit crisper, and with that bit more separation. I also felt like sounds like saxophone and piano, those kind of very tonally complex sounds, those seemed a little bit more kind of accurate or natural to me when the sync short filter was switched on. And then as I listened to more and more tracks, what I found was that when I took away the upsampling and went back to just the non-oversampled mode on the Gustard R26, I tended to lose a little bit of sense of depth in the soundstage as well. So things like depth, separation, and tonal accuracy were all improved by going to upsampling. As I then moved through sync medium and sync long filters, what I found was that the longer the attenuation, kind of the softer and smoother the sound got. And that could be good or bad. Some will say that it's a more relaxing, more analog, kind of easier to listen to sound with the longer attenuation. Whereas there'll be others of you out there that will say that the sound is more defined, more technically correct, you could say, with the shorter attenuation. And so that's going to be largely up to you. The takeaway from this, though, is that shorter attenuation is generally going to give you a tighter, crisper, kind of sharper transient type sound. And the longer attenuation is going to smooth that off just a little bit more, for better or for worse. And I'll leave that bit up to you. For the record, I don't think sync short, medium, or long are my preferences for any of the settings that I tried within HQ Player. I think there's other filters that I personally would recommend, and we will get to those soon. Before we get there though, the next test for me was to compare four seemingly quite similar filter sets within HQ Player, and that's the range of sync M filters. I've heard it talked about before that people think the Sync M filters are quite similar to what's in the M scaler, and I don't entirely know that I agree, as I'll tell you more about at the end when I do the direct M scaler HQ player comparison. But what I was particularly interested in when we were looking at the Sync M filters is that if we look now at the software, we've got a few different options of Sync M. There's Sync M, Sync MX, Sync MG, and then Sync MGA. What these stand for is you've got your standard Sync M, which uses a million taps. You've got your Sync MX, which uses a million taps with constant time. And now I have to say, I haven't delved in and tried to understand the ins and outs of what that actually means. What I was talking about with my patrons when I did the behind the scenes for the planning of this one was that I find that with this kind of level of detail and software, it's an area that I personally am not so interested in. And so I apologize that I haven't done the depth of research that I do for a lot of my other reviews. But on this one, what I was really interested in was not how does it work, what does it mean, what are the variables, so much as which one actually makes the music sound best. So this one is differentiated in the manual as having constant time, whatever that means in the upsampling reference. If anyone watching knows, please feel free to drop it in the comments. And then as we then move on to the Sync MG, that's using a Gaussian version constant time. Now Gaussian is an approach to noise shaping as far as I understand it, so it's going to be a different way of doing the filtering, dithering or noise shaping here. And then the final version, the Sync MGA, is an appetizing Gaussian version. Now, appetizing filters are interesting where they're an adjusting and sort of constantly variable type filter. Some people will say they're better because they smooth out issues. Others will say they're not so good because they can actually smooth over detail. And so for me, what I wanted to find out and what I wanted to share with you was not which one does what and how, but which one sounds better and why. Why in terms of in what ways does it sound better? What's it doing to the music to improve it or to damage the signal? First and foremost, going from no upsampling at all, just like I did before, and then switching on Sync M, this was a definite improvement in my opinion. I would say it was better than the Sync Short, Sync Medium, and Sync Long that I tried before. The Million Tap version, the Sync M here, that's with the capital M, that for me was a better sounding filter overall. Specifically, what it was doing with the music was making everything clearer, more defined, but also easier to listen to. It was bringing a sense of refinement to the sound, not smoothing things off, but making it easier, more natural, and therefore more enjoyable overall. Once again, I felt like adding in the upsampling was improving the depth in the soundstage. And as I carried on listening, the upsampled Sync M version was able to draw out extra information on the music that I wasn't always hearing with no upsampling applied. And so things like, in one of the tracks I listened to, there was a very high frequency resonance from a stringed instrument, it was some sort of hammered stringed instrument, and there was a specific sort of high frequency resonance and ringing from that instrument that was far easier to hear and understand and pick out from the music with the upsampled Sync M version compared to no upsampling at all. Going from Sync M to Sync MX, I have to say I didn't find a huge difference. So this sort of constant time version of the Sync M filter, I don't know if it's actually helping with the way I had it set up. I was using 48 kilohertz files, they were being upsampled all the way to 768 kilohertz. 
And on that particular setting, that particular setup, I don't feel like there was any difference between Sync M and Sync MX. Where it probably could have a difference though, is if you're having multiple different sorts of initial sample rates. So for instance, if you've got some 44.1, some 48, some 96, and some 192 kilohertz, maybe some 88.1, et cetera, in there as well, 88.2, I should say. With those different frequencies in there, that's where it might start to make a difference. But that brings me to one of the questions that I have come up multiple times as I reviewed HQ Player, and that is, why do you necessarily want a filter that you're going to have to think about what the sample rates are going in or what the quality of the source material is going in, do you really want to go in there every single time and optimize your settings for the particular tracks that you're about to listen to? I know I don't. For me, I want a setting that's going to work well across everything I pour into the system. And I should add at this point, I've reached out a couple of times through the, I think it was through the online email system of the HQ Player or Signalist website. I've reached out a couple of times to try to get in touch with Jussie who designed this. I would have loved to have a chat to him about some of these things, ask some of these questions. So if you know Jussie or Jussie, if you're watching this and there's still a chance for us to get together, maybe have a chat on the podcast, share it as a video here, I'd love to understand more. I'd love to share more understanding with the viewers of the channel. So please do reach out to me, leave a comment down here, however you want to get in touch, I'd love to chat to you further. I think what you've done with the software is nothing short of extraordinary. It's incredibly powerful, in some ways for someone like me it's too powerful, but I'd definitely love to have a chat and better understand it and share more with others. Moving on now from the Sync MX filter, and the next one was to go from the regular Sync M to the Sync MG or the Gaussian version one. I felt like as I listened to these two, the Gaussian version to me occasionally could get just a little bit too edgy. The Sync M was overall a bit smoother for me as I listened to it. One of the test tracks I was listening to used some sampled drums, and I felt like on the Sync MG filter, those sampled drums were just a little bit harsher. Now potentially that's because the Sync MG filter was being more accurate, I'm not sure, but I was finding it a bit less enjoyable to listen to. And in fact, as I just glanced at my notes again, one of the things I've written down is I think the transients are a bit crisper on the Sync MG, and that can be good or bad depending on what you're listening to. So I think Sync M and Sync MG are kind of similar enough that it's going to come down to trying both and seeing what you prefer. It's going to be a system synergy thing. It's going to be about how you like your sound and your preferences. But ultimately what I found was that as I flicked through Sync M, Sync MX, Sync MG and Sync MGA, with each of these, as you'd probably expect, the sound was pretty similar across the board. And so in each case, it was one of those things where you'd have to kind of just have a listen tweak it, see which one you prefer, tweak it again, see which one you prefer, and so go through all four of them if that's the way you chose to go. Now, as I said before, at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you what I think is the best setting that I've heard on HQ Player, and that's across multiple devices. But for now, I wanted to raise the fact that one of my challenges with HQ Player, and this goes back to why I love to talk to Jussie and understand this a bit more, one of my challenges with HQ Player is I just think there's too much choice. If we have a look at this list here, so this is just for PCM, it's got nothing to do with doing DSD yet. If you're looking at PCM, this list here on screen are all the different choices that you could make for the filters for your setup. Now, if it was really cut and dry and you could listen to each one of these and say, that one's better than that one, this one's better than that one, and you could very quickly narrow down your favorite, that would be one thing. But what I found as I played around with these was that a lot of the times it's a bit track dependent. Other times it's going to come down to maybe the devices and the gear you're using, which one you prefer or don't prefer. And then that's before we even start talking about things like noise shaping, which then further alter the sound. And so the combination of a filter and a noise shaping approach, those have their own set of variables where all of a sudden you could literally spend years going through every possible combination to find the one you like most. And that for me is where there's a little bit of a problem with HQ Player. Not with HQ Player, the, the software itself is great, so I shouldn't say it quite that way. It's more that I have a problem with having so much choice. There'll be those of you out there that love it, you like to tweak, you like to play, and that's fantastic. But for those of you that are more like me, where you just want to hear your music sounding great, and you want to enjoy the music and not worry about the settings, it would have been really cool to see a setting, and maybe this can be implemented in future, it would be really cool to have all of what you see on screen now, have that available in an advanced mode, and then maybe just have a really simple mode for people like me who just want to know which one's going to give me the best sound in general. Maybe there's the best sound for those that want smoother, richer sound, the best sound for those that value soundstage space. Just have a few clearly defined options that give you specific characteristics for a particular outcome. 
I think that would make HQ Player a far more valuable tool to so many more people because if you're anything like me, you're going to see this list and it's going to be overwhelming and put you off trying it. And so as I said, I feel like HQ Player is a little bit daunting, a little bit overwhelming, and there's just a few too many options to choose from. And then the other challenge that I have that's buried within that is if we have a look at another filter, and this one is called the Polysync Gauss Half Band. So it's this one here. This filter is specifically designed that it's for a very high quality recording only. It's got some challenges apparently where it doesn't necessarily do a good job as far as I understand the description in the manual. It doesn't do a good job of necessarily cutting off sounds that start to go beyond the Nyquist frequency. So Nyquist is the sampling theory that defines the range of frequencies that we sample. In the case of say 44.1 kilohertz, it's designed to sample the 20 to 20 kilohertz range. And so we do sampling at double the maximum frequency. What I mean by that is if the highest frequency you're wanting to sample is 20 kilohertz, then you have to do your actual sampling at higher than 40 kilohertz. And because we need a bit of space for the roll off of the filters, that's why we push up to 44.1 kilohertz. And so at 44.1 kilohertz, you can safely sample any frequency up to 22.05 kilohertz. Now, if that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry too much about it. The only thing you need to know here is that this particular filter, the Polysync Gauss Half Band, apparently is a bit leaky around the edges. And so if there is any material in a 44.1 kilohertz file that snuck over 22.05 kilohertz, then apparently this filter is going to have some troubles with that. The biggest challenge that I have here is that in the manual, it's specifically recommended for high quality recordings only. And that's going to mean very high quality mixing and mastering. It's going to mean very tight tolerances around the sample rates and how they filtered off any sort of ultrasonic sounds. The challenge I have there is how are you going to know? How are you going to know if that recording that you happen to love and that maybe sounds great on your system, how are you going to know if that's actually a high quality recording? What if it's a wonderful sounding recording that's actually got some technical issues in terms of ultrasonic noise? These are the challenges that you just aren't going to know. Maybe if you've got the tools to analyze the audio before you listen to it, you can tell. But this comes back to what I said before. I don't want to have to think about choosing a filter where I know exactly the quality of each file I'm putting into it. I want to choose a filter that's going to work well for everything. And I don't say this to knock the fact that that filter choice is there. I think it's fantastic. I just say it to kind of reiterate why I think the choice and the range of options within HQ Player is a bit overwhelming and should maybe get hidden behind some kind of advanced mode so that those of us that are like me and just want a simple, almost plug and play, maybe not quite, but closer to a plug and play experience, I think that's where filters like this are kind of getting in the way. For those of you that love to do the analysis and you might know the quality of the files, it's great to have that there. But I think it's overwhelming to many people and I'm certainly one of those that just chooses to avoid getting too deep into this because of those sorts of challenges. Again, it's all about enjoying the music for me, not fiddling with settings all the time. The next filters I wanted to try was some linear phase versus minimum phase filters. And for this test, I was using the Polysync XTR, LP and MP filters. So LP being linear phase, MP being medium phase. When it comes to the filters on the DACs that you get, like a topping or an SMSL or anything built around a Sabre DAC that gives you choices or an AKM for that matter, they're all going to do it. Any DAC that's built on one of those chips that gives you filter choices what you'll normally find is options like fast linear, slow linear, fast or slow minimum phase will be in there as well. And so what this is all about is how the filter itself handles the time domain. For me, I always tend to choose a linear phase filter. And so as not to draw things out, I'm just going to cut straight to the chase here and say that that carried through here. I definitely feel like the linear phase version of the filters within HQ Player is better. I felt like the minimum phase compressed the sound a little bit more. There was less space, less separation. Things started to sound more congested comparatively when I went to minimum phase. And so that's going to be another tip for me when choosing filters is I think generally it is worth staying with linear phase. Minimum phase can be good if you want to absolutely minimize latency because to produce linear phase filters, there's a little bit of delay added is how I understand it. But unless you've got major issues with latency, you shouldn't have any problems using linear phase. And the sound quality benefits, in my opinion at least, are definitely worth it. Another set of filters that I tried, and a lot of this was based on kind of reading through the manual and deciding which ones I thought were maybe being recommended or suggested by the manual. The next ones that I tried were things like the Polysync Gauss XL, the Polysync Gauss Short, and the Polysync Gauss XLA. 
with again the short, the XL and the XLA being about the length of attenuation. So short being a quick cutoff, long being a slower cutoff, and LA being an apodized long cutoff, apodizing being more that variable approach again. And what I mean by there is that it's variable based on the incoming signal. And what I found here was that again, there was an improvement from not having the upsampling. It wasn't drastic, but it was there. It improved the sense of space and separation. The sound was a bit smoother and easier to listen to as well. But as I went through different tracks to do my testing, what I found was that on one track, I would prefer one setting. On another track, I'd prefer another. So on something kind of smoother and more relaxed to start with, like jazz, I prefer the XL setting, which was that longer attenuation. Whereas on something with a bit more kind of edge to it, I was generally preferring the shorter filter. I feel like the appetizing version of this started to soften things off even further, for better or worse once again. And so my end result was that I feel like the short version was a little bit crisper on transients. It had a little bit more attack to it, but as a result, it didn't sound quite as smooth and easy to listen to. And so again, this is one of those cases where I don't really have a conclusion to draw. And I don't mean to go on like a broken record here, but the point here is that all these filters make subtle differences. Some of these filters sound better on some tracks than others. And then it comes back to the idea of being very hard to choose which is the right filter for you, because it's going to depend on which test tracks you use at the time that you're doing your testing. And so with that in mind, let's fast forward, let's shortcut a little bit now and get to the stuff that I think is actually going to define how I believe HQ Player is best set up and best used if you're somebody like me. And to get there, I started to narrow things down and I really wanted to look at two particular filters. There was the Polysync Gauss filter and there was the Closed Form M filter. The reason I chose these filters is if we look at the manual for a moment, the Polysync Gauss filter, what I was drawn to was the fact that it's using a sync based filter similar to what the M scaler does. So from a mathematical point of view, according to my discussions with Rob Watts, this should be the correct way to actually process and upsample the audio. On top of that, the manual suggests that it has optimal time frequency response. And so all of that had me thinking this could be a really good option. Finally, if you look at the next two columns, which is the special focus, sort of the key things that this filter will improve, and then the genre that it's looking at, is that it's going to focus on transients and timbre, which are both very important in musical enjoyment, and the genres are specified as any. So in other words, this should be a filter that should work for anything and make it sound good. The other filter that I was keen to try was the closed form M filter. And if we have a look at that one, this is using a closed form interpolation with 1 million taps. Now that doesn't tell us a lot, it also doesn't have anything for special focus in the genres, but based on some of the reading I'd done, I had a feeling that this may have been closest to what's being done in the M scaler. It was just a hunch, I can't remember if anyone actually specifically stated it, or if I just kind of inferred it from what I read, but I was curious to try that one as well because again, it's using a million taps, which is the same as the M scaler. That means it's gonna process the signal a million times essentially. And so I was curious to see how that one sounded and whether or not I had any reason to prefer that over something like the Polysync Gauss. Starting off with the Polysync Gauss filter now, and I wanted to test this again as a bit of a baseline up against what the standard upsampling or oversampling filters within the Gustard R26 were going to do. As I moved between having the oversampling switched on in the R26 and the signal coming straight out of Rune and going into the R26, and then switching off oversampling in the R26 and using HQ Player, what I heard was that going via HQ Player, there was a significant upgrade in the sound quality. The Polysync Gauss filter gave a significant improvement in the sense of space in the music, particularly in the sense of depth in the sound. And I felt like the tonal richness of everything was improved as well. So again, sounds like piano, saxophone, those sounds that should have a lot of resonance within them, those all sounded more natural, more true to life, more kind of filled out with the Polysync Gauss filter from HQ Player than they did with the internal filters on the Gustard. Then when I went from the Polysync Gauss over to the Closed Form M, that to me was the turning point. This is where I started to hear an absolute benefit in using something like HQ Player and switching off the oversampling within your DAC. Going between Polysync Gauss and Closed Form M, I was getting even more depth again in the sound. And the key thing for me was that everything just sounded so real. In my experience with upsampling, there's three things that I kind of look for in a really good sounding system. And those are that you should get really good sense of crispness of the leading edges or the transients on notes without it being harsh, but very, very clearly defined, a good sense of rhythm and drive in the music. You should get a fantastic sense of space as a result. So when those transients are just right, they give your ears all the information that you need for filling out the spatial information within the music. And so separation of sound should be better. Overall soundstage width should be excellent and depth should be much improved as well. 
And then finally, what it should all also lead to is better tonal accuracy. So every single instrument should sound just right. You should be able to hear the actual resonance of the instruments, not just kind of a one note sound of them. And everything I've just described is exactly what I felt the closed form M filter was doing. Now, what I can't tell you here is if this is the best setting for every possible setup. But for me with the Gustard R26, it was easily the best thing I'd heard. And I didn't come into this with any specific expectations. The description that's in the manual actually led me to believe that this might not be the best choice because it hasn't got any of those notes sitting alongside it. But to my ears, this was the one that sounded the most lifelike, the most real, and most importantly to me, the most like the M Scalar. And I use the M Scalar as a reference because it's a sound that I just consistently enjoy. Whenever I switch on the TT2 and the M Scalar, the musical enjoyment is always there. That to me is the ultimate goal here. I don't, as I said before, I don't really care about what's technically correct or incorrect from a kind of behind the scenes point of view. What I care about is which settings give me a sound that is most like a real musical listening experience, a live musical listening experience. And the closed form M was definitely the one that got me closest. And so from there, it was a question of if I've got that set up, let's say I've said that closed form M is my choice of filter, then should I also play around with some of the dithering settings? So the dithering and noise shaping is about how the upsampling process handles getting the noise out of the audible frequency range and pushing it up into the inaudible range. And so I set up a test just to move through multiple dithering options. You can see that thankfully there's a few less dithering options and there are filtering options. That's definitely a godsend. And then looking through the manual, I kind of narrowed it down a little bit. So here I wanted to look at the NS4, the NS5, the LNS15, the TBDF and the shaped filtering or noise shaping, I should say. This was a list that I put together by looking at the um, manual. Just find the section here. There's quite a lot of information in the manual, as you can see. And so this list was something that I put together after looking at the manual and trying to work out which ones I thought were going to be the best. If I just find, here we go. So you can read through here. I deliberately avoided these bottom ones because they're generally not recommended or the NS1 is for lower sample rates and I was sampling all the way to 768, or up sampling I should say. And looking at the rest, I was choosing based on what was described within the manual. And that's why I removed some of them such as Gaussian I didn't bother with because it's recommended for rates at or below 96 kilohertz. And so my end result was, as I said, the shaped TPDF, which is kind of like the default setting that is recommended here. LNS15, NS4, and NS5. I started off in that default TPDF setting, and I went between the others from there. And what I found was that moving to the NS4 setting, that for me was a little bit flatter in sound. It didn't sound as natural to me as the TPDF setting. When I say flatter, by the way, I mean there was less depth in the sound. I'm not talking about dynamics so much as space here. And the sound got a little bit crisper in NS4 mode, but not in a good or more natural way. So for me, there was no point using NS4. The TPDF was clearly better. Going to the NS5 mode, and I felt like this was a closer match with TPDF. It was a little bit crisper than the TPDF, but otherwise quite similar. Definitely more natural than the NS4 to my ears. But ultimately, as I went back and forth between the two, the TPDF was always the one that I was preferring. For my ears, for enjoyment of listening, it was always TPDF that I was happy to return to. Moving on to the LNS15 setting, and this was the one that for me became an improvement over TPDF. But it was also really hard to nail down why it was an improvement. The only thing I could really pick out was that it was like the onset of the sounds. If a, if a guitar string was plucked, or a drum was hit, or any other sound began, it was like the onset of that sound was more natural. It was like it started and came into space and time more naturally, more true to life or something. Very hard to explain, but it just sounded more natural, more real, and more like I was live in the room with the musicians. Again, I don't think the difference was huge from the TPDF, but LNS15 was just a little bit preferable to me. Finally, the shaped setting, I feel like was quite good. I didn't mind it so much. Some things got a bit more crisp and a bit more defined in the sound. In particular, I felt like high frequency sounds were more defined than they were with TPDF or LNS15, and that could help with a sense of articulation. So if you have a system that needs a bit more energy in the upper frequencies and the upper registers, you might want to try out shaped. But for me, I would either be going with TPDF or more likely LNS15. And so LNS15 is kind of my default go-to now, and it's the one that I would be recommending. And so at this point, I had just two more tests to do. I tried everything up until this point with the Gustard R26, 
And knowing that that was an Artois ladder deck, I was curious to see what would happen if I tried all this same stuff with a chip-based DAC, and in this case, the SMSL DO300. There are two reasons that I wanted to try the SMSL DO300. One of them was because being a Delta Sigma chip-based DAC, it's a good opportunity to actually try the Delta Sigma upsampling coming from HQ Player and going straight into the Delta Sigma DAC. The idea being there that you're bypassing the process that these DACs always use if you feed them a PCM signal. So PCM signals being WAVE, MP3, or FLAC files generally. If you're feeding any of those sorts of signals into a DAC like the DO300, any of those AKM or ESS or Cirrus Logic type DACs, if you're sending a regular signal anywhere between your sort of 44.1 up to 192 kilohertz files, if you're feeding those into a DAC like that, it's going to be doing a process of transferring that from what's called pulse code modulation into sigma delta modulation. Now, I'm not going to try and explain here and now what the difference between PCM and SDM is because it's going to get very technical and difficult to explain easily and quickly. But the point is that the DAC chips used in DACs like the DO300 they're natively wanting a DSD signal. And so rather than taking PCM and having it turned into Delta Sigma within the DAC or Sigma Delta, instead what we can do here with HQ Player is take your starting file, which is the PCM in this case, and have it transferred in high, high quality into a Sigma Delta signal before it goes to the DAC. So the DAC doesn't do any kind of resampling, it just takes it, processes it, and spits it out as I played around with the various filters that are available for the SDM mode in HQ Player, again what I found was that I was most preferring the closed form approach. The closed form 16M giving us 16 million taps there, and I don't necessarily feel like it was vastly better or even really noticeably better than the closed form M with the million taps, but that was the filter that I chose to work with as my testing ground because I'd already identified which filters I tended to like and not like so much. And so the big thing for me to test with the DSD was what's called the modulators. And so there's lots of different ones to choose from within here. What I found though, to keep things pretty short, is that as soon as I started going to the various extended ones, so this is what the EC ones are, any of these extended compensation filters like say ASDM 7EC, what I was finding was that even on a computer which is fairly powerful, it's not an absolute top of the range computer, but I use it for my video and photo editing, so it's got plenty of grunt, it's got a high quality graphics card in it, and I was using the graphics card as part of my processing but I was still getting regular lag and regular pauses in the music whilst trying to play through those modulators. And this comes back to what I said before about the fact that this is a software program. The moment you're working with software, you need to make sure that your hardware is optimized to work with that software. There's the chance for glitches and bugs. A couple of times I had the system freeze up, which is probably because I was changing so many settings so often. But the point is that it's software and therefore it's only going to be as good as the hardware you're running it on and the way you've got it set up. And so what I found was that as I continued testing and playing around, that I really just came down to testing between the ASDM5 and the ASDM7 to give me a sense of what the modulators might do. Ultimately, this came down to the choice to see what the difference between a fifth order and a seventh order would do in terms of the modulators. What does a higher order modulator sound like? Is it better to go higher? Does it make a difference, etc.? And I have to say that going from the fifth order to the seventh order modulator definitely made a difference. In other words, ASDM7 is better than ASDM5 in my opinion. What I immediately noticed was a greater sense of depth in the sound again, and a smoother and more refined sound without losing detail. So it was basically like everything that ASDM5 did, 7 did a bit better, plus giving me more depth. Now, depending on your system, your setup, the power of your PC or your computer, you may be able to get away with some of these more kind of extended compensation versions. You can get into the Super, the Super 512FS, lots of different things there. The manual does explain what they do. But for me, I don't really see the point in having these lower order modulators because ultimately what I found as I started to play around with them is that the ASDM7s just sound better. And so again, this comes back to what I said before, it would be really nice to see a much simplified version that's available for people like me that just want the music to sound good, and then have all these other choices behind some sort of advanced mode that's hidden from those of us that are otherwise going to get overwhelmed and stop playing with the software because there's just too many choices. The good news is that if you're like me and you just want to know what's going to sound good on my setup, then what I would say is that if you're looking for a good PCM setting, in other words, going from say 44.1 or 48 kilohertz files or whatever your starting base might be up to say 768 kilohertz or similar, then I would be going with the closed form M and LNS15 dithering or noise shaping. Or if you're looking to send a signal into a Sigma Delta DAC like the SMSLs and the toppings and stuff like that, then that's where you might choose to use what I've got here set up on screen, which is the closed form 16M 
and the ASDM7 modulator. To my mind, these are the best simple settings where you can just go in, switch them on, get it set up and leave it alone, and you should get fantastic quality sound from HQ Player. As I said before, if you're someone that wants to get in and tweak and play and really understand more about what it's capable of doing, then please go for it. But if you find the range of settings overwhelming, then I would recommend just copying what I've got on screen and going from there. The one caveat being that when it comes to bit depth in the PCM settings down here, then you may want to do a bit of research and find out exactly what the optimal setting is for your DAC. Now you can leave it as default, of course. I believe if you're connecting up via USB, it might be able to work that out for itself as it does the transfer of the data. But this is another one of those areas where it's beyond me to actually want to dive too deep and want to do the research to find out what every single DAC that I might ever want to play with, what its effective number of bits is. And so instead, I'm just going to leave it on default. Perhaps there's a slight difference if you can get that bit depth exactly right, but is it worth the hassle and the fiddle and the time of doing all the research and finding out every time I want to change my DAC around? For me, no, it's not. So I'll leave that one up to you. I believe there are threads on Headfire and other places where you can go and ask about this and find out what settings you should put your DAC on. So feel free to hunt that down. I believe, for instance, the Gustard R26 is a 15-bit DAC from an effective number of bits point of view. And so you can change that setting if you want to, but I've just been leaving it on default. And so now this brings us around to the moment that I was certainly waiting for, and maybe you were too, and that is to see, can HQ Player replace something like an M-Scaler? For my first test, what I tried to do was run a signal via my SU6 digital-to-digital -digital converter. So that was going to be coming bit perfect out of Rune, going direct into the M-Scaler, and then from the M-Scaler into the TT2. And then I also ran a USB connection from my computer direct to the TT2, so nowhere near the M-Scaler. And that was being driven by HQ Player. Obviously, I made sure to match the volume levels because the M-Scaler has a bit of headroom padding because sometimes when you're resampling things, you can actually have a peak that goes higher than the original signal. And so I made sure to reduce the output levels in HQ Player to match what I was getting from the M-Scaler. And that's another thing that you actually should also do within the HQ Player software, and you'll see in mine that I've got it done over here, is that you do want to make sure that you've pulled back a little bit on the output volume of HQ Player because if you do get those oversamples where the reconstructed waveform goes higher than any of the individual samples, you need to have a bit of headroom for that to avoid clipping and therefore a harshness in the sound. And so once I had everything set up and volume matched, I was able to really quickly switch between having the M scale into the TT2 or having just HQ play into the TT2. What I was hearing when using the closed form M filters and the LNS15 noise shaping into the TT2 was ever so slightly less depth than I got from the M scaler. I also felt like the sound was a touch smoother from the M-Scaler, again, not in a lacking detail smoothness sort of way, but just a more refined, easy to listen to kind of way. That could be the M-Scaler dealing with extra noise and keeping noise out of the system. I had different connection types going on with USB going into the TT2 versus the digital to digital converter being in the middle of the chain between the PC and the M-Scaler. So there were a few other variables that we can't completely eliminate. But the end result for me was that I felt like the sound from the M scaler with the TT2 was just maybe a tiny little bit better. You could potentially argue that there was a little bit more texture in the sound from the TT2 direct from the HQ player, but there were also a few little glitches coming through as well. And this goes back to what I said before with my enjoyment of the M scaler. I'm a fan of the M scaler because it works. You plug it in, you connect up any source that you like to it, and it works every time. Whereas with HQ Player, there was a lot of fiddling to get it set up in terms of everything I've gone to to work out what the right filter choices were for my tastes. And then on top of that, even when I had it set up properly, I was hearing little tiny glitches and the M scaler for me was still ever so slightly preferable in terms of that extra depth and just that extra sense of refinement and smoothness and that easy to listen to quality. But I also wanted to try one more test here. I was conscious of the fact that the TT2 doesn't have a non-oversampling mode. There's no way to switch off its own internal processing. And so I didn't know feeding it a 768 kilohertz signal from HQ player was actually exactly the same as feeding it from the M scaler, where maybe the TT2's internal software knows that when it's being fed by the M scaler through the dual BNCs to process and, and deal with the signal differently, I don't know if any of that's going on. So my secondary test here was to go back to the SMSL DO300 because on the DO300 you can actually switch off the Sigma Delta upsampling, oversampling, filters, etc. You can switch that off and essentially have it in non-oversampling mode. So what I was able to compare now was a fully upsampled signal from HQ player going into a different sort of DAC in the DO300 
up against the TT2 M Scaler combo. And in this case, of course, I had to take an output from both DACs and feed it to an external headphone amp. And so this was the Burson Solos 3XGT, the new upgraded version. And as I flip between the two, I have to say it was very, very close. I probably ever so slightly preferred the sound from the TT2 and the M Scaler. There was just a tiny bit more sense of space in the overall sound, so space between instruments, space in the overall sound stage, but it was very, very subtle. I also felt like the sound from the TT2 and the M Scaler was just a little bit smoother, a little bit more natural sounding. Again, not losing any detail, just becoming more refined. But the key thing here, and the thing that I really want to point out, is that there is absolutely no way I think I would have picked this blind. There were differences as I flipped between the two, but if you were to play me one and then the other in a blind situation, I might be able to pick the fact that they're different when you switch them, but it was close enough that I wouldn't be confident. And on top of that, I'd have a hard time telling you which one was the TT2 M scaler and which one was the DO300 with the HQ player upsampling. So I'm not for a second going to sit here and say that the TT2 and the M scaler is clearly better. It is a little bit different. And the differences are things that I slightly prefer, but it's not clear cut enough that I can say you absolutely have to buy a TT2 and M scaler to get the best possible sound. Because at this level of closeness, if you were to take away the TT2 and M scaler, I'd still be wonderfully happy with the DO300, an upsampled HQ player signal, and then out to a high quality amp. Just to be thorough, the final things I tested here was whether or not going to an SDM signal or like a DSD signal going in versus a PCM signal. I tested to see if that made any difference and it was pretty much indistinguishable. So it doesn't really matter whether you're sending a high sample rate PCM or a high sample rate DSD signal from HQ player into the DO300, it made basically no difference. And then also when I took the DO300 and switched its own filtering back on to mimic what most DACs are going to be like because very few DACs have the filtering off option that the DO300 has. So if you had yourself a topping D90 or a D70, which by the way I've got coming up for review soon, if you had one of those where you can't switch off the filtering, then if you just were to switch on the linear phase filter that I spoke about before, what I found was that there was a very slight drop in quality from the linear phase filter on the DO300 which is going to be the same on any other DAC using a similar DAC chip, there is a very, very slight drop in quality, but it's not too much. And so that brings us around to a conclusion now after quite a complex and challenging review. This is one of the hardest reviews I've ever put together because there's very little clear-cut kind of definitive response type stuff I can give you here. All of this is going to be subjective based on your preferences, the system you're using it with, all of those things. But what I can tell you without a doubt now is that if you want to get yourself a system that's PC based, you want to have a DAC receiving an upsampled signal from your PC to maximize sound quality, then you absolutely can. And even better than that is that you can get sound quality that's up there alongside a multi-thousand dollar system like the TT2 and M Scaler. It's not as convenient. It's only going to work with your PC and it's still not quite as good. But the difference is maybe a 1% type thing, and no one I think is ever going to pick it blind. Unfortunately, you're either going to have to play around with the settings until you get it right, and there's a lot of variables as you've seen here, or you're going to have to take somebody's word for it as to which settings are best, whether it be me or somebody else. But the good news is that I think HQ Player offers an incredible sense of value for money if you get the settings right and you're able to use a PC-based system. As I said before, I would love to see HQ Player integrate some kind of a simplified menu option for people like me that just want to click a button and have something work and sound great and focus more on the music and less on the settings. But it's undeniable just how powerful and impressive the end results from HQ Player can be. And so to bring all this to a close, just to recap everything I've said here in as short as possible way I can is that if you want to try out HQ Player for yourself and see what I've been talking about, you can download it for free. I'll put a link down below in the description. Download it. You can use it in 30-minute blocks as long as you want, 30 minutes at a time. You can try it out, try some settings, and see how it works in your system. Personally, my recommended settings for what they're worth is to go with a PCM setting of the closed form M filter using the LNS15 noise shaping and the default bit setting, unless you happen to know what the correct effective number of bits is for your DAC. Or if you want to put out a DSD signal or an SDM signal, they're the same thing by the way. If you want to put that out, then the other option is you can go for the closed form M or the closed form 16M, and I would recommend just using the ASDM7 modulator. If you can use some of the higher level ASDM7s, give it a try if your computer will handle it. But if not, know that you're still getting excellent sound just with a standard ASDM7. 
So give some of those settings a go, see how you find the end result, and hopefully you enjoy the sound quality from HQ Player as much as I have. What I should also mention is that if you've got a particular setup that you love, maybe you've spent time tweaking and playing with the settings yourself to optimize it for your setup, then I'd love it if you'd share down below what DAC you're using it with and what your favorite settings are in terms of the filter you're choosing to use, whether it's PCM or SDM, which modulator or noise shaper you're using, and what bit depth if it's PCM as well. Share it down below, and that way others that are watching this video and wanting to set this up and try it out for themselves, they can benefit from your experience as well. So thank you everyone for watching. Hopefully this has been useful, valuable, informative for you. As always, if it has, please hit the like button and also subscribe and ring the notification bell as well. But for now, let me leave it to the music and probably the up sampling, and I'll look forward to seeing you here next time on Passion for Sound.